still find it. Yeah, you know, that is something they should have with this vision in the Yamar time. We're about to get going again, everybody. Uh, I just want to remind, uh, the Orange Show Monument is open, and we invite you in between things to go explore and look around, but please do not use the back entrance as the band is loading in. The My Dolls are in the building, and they're getting set up. Uh, we've got the Sanders Street gate open, so if you would kindly just go around to the front door and experience the Orange Show in the sequence that it is meant to be experienced, uh, we would appreciate that. Um, Next panel here, or really our first panel for the day, is a panel on Art Park Parade history. And uh, I would like to introduce our panelists. And by the way, I just want to mention some of our panelists did not know that there were going to be panelists until like one minute ago, and some maybe like five minutes ago. Uh, so I uh, uh, appreciate everybody's uh, flexibility, uh, but uh, I'm so happy to see these particular people up here. Uh, this is going to be really Mary Mann, uh, she's the university archivist at uh, Special Collections, University of Houston Libraries. Suzanne Tice was our founding programming director here at the Orange Show, and she's... Give a big hand for Suzanne Tice. None of us would be here without her. She's at Discovery Green right now, so all the fun stuff that you experience at Discovery Green has Orange Show DNA all over it. Brian Taylor of the Santa Car, one of our most popular and beloved art car artists going back forever, and a former Orange Show employee back in the day. Cody Ledvina, he's, our, he's the Orange Show archivist, and just an all around good guy, and a great artist too, I might say. Uh, and I'm Pete, I'm just gonna be the moderator, I'm gonna let these folks do most of the talking, but I'm gonna try and kind of steer and direct Festival in 1986. Uh, the New Music America Festival was a national festival that was held at about 10 different cities across the United States and one in Canada uh, for many, many years. Uh, Houstonian Michael Galbraith uh, ran the organization and he was also the director of the 1986 New Music America. So in 1986, New Music America kicked off uh, with a parade, and the parade was led uh, with a marching band that was directed by Tom Cora, who is a, was a fabulous avant rock improvisational um, uh, musician, one of my favorites, I love him. Um, and uh, there was also a lot of art cars and decorated bikes. Um, I do see somebody who is on a decorated bike right there. And if you go to our table over here, there are tons of pictures from that parade. And there is a picture over there of J.R. Delgado on a bike uh, with George Shea. But uh, anyway, uh, that was a long time ago, and uh, it was a great day. I was there. I rode my bike, too. Um, yes, and then we also had noisemakers. We decorated the bikes, and we had noisemakers, and I think JR had a skull on the front of his. Um, it's it's uh, Come to our table and see it. We've got lots of stuff from New Music America there, but the parade started... And I also saw Scotty Prescott here. He maybe got in a lot, a little, almost got it, us into a little bit of trouble because he brought a car that created a lot of exhaust. Um, but anyway, so people went down the street. Um, Kathy and Diana from the My Dolls, they uh, led um, the marching brand, band with batons. I hope I'm getting this right. And I think they walked the whole entire thing backwards. But I don't know how much of that is urban lore and how much of that is true. That is the way I remember the story. Um, anyway, so 
Uh, they went down Montrose, and it ended at uh, the Sculpture Garden at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, which was just opening, and it was the opening celebration. It was also an event for New Music America, and John Cage performed there, and it was a really fabulous day in the history of Houston's art scene and music scene. Yeah, and there's a John Cage concert, and then all of a sudden here comes this noisy parade, right? And John Cage loved it. I mean, this is like distributed by John Cage, pretty much. Absolutely, he did love it. Uh, Suzanne, you were there that day too. Can you pick up on that and maybe weave in a little bit the uh, display that happened in what is now Smither Park, I believe? Wasn't this an early uh, Orange Show uh, exhibition of, of cars uh, out on that lot? Oh. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm talking about something I don't really know about. Um, so we, oh gosh, I don't remember when this was. We did a show, uh, a it was called The Road Show. So it was in 1986. I'm trying to remember, I think June. Um, Scotty was there. Uh, I know that. Um, there were like, I don't know, a dozen cars. We found the pinstriper in, in Pasadena who pinstriped Elvis's cars. And he came out and demonstrated pinstriping. Um, we, so we had kids' workshops. And then, you know, I just think it was so very funny that the first thing that we, I'd never thought of the cars moving. We thought of bringing them together, but we just, they were stationary. So that was a precursor. That was after new music. We had planned it. Um, yeah, anyway, that, that's what is that. I was there the day of the, it was really so much fun. Um, I drove the fruit mobile and we blew bubbles and there were kids blowing bubbles out of it. It was really fun. There's a picture of you blowing bubbles from the fruit mobile over. Just to mention, there's a, a selection of photos by George Hickson in our uh, impromptu art car parade history gallery back over there. And we were supposed to have the fruit mobile here today. Needs a few more repairs before the parade. Scotty. You want to come on? You want to say something? No. <laughs> I haven't prepared anything. N none of us have. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, that's obvious, but that, uh, I'll, I'll sit over here. I'll just. Here, tell us I'm about tell us about the arc over you, apparently. Tell us about yeah. Montrose, about going down Montrose with that car that you had. Oh, what which, was it? What? Which time? That went with New Music America. Oh. Uh, I remember we were supposed to, the fruit mobile, all the cars were supposed to pull over to the curb. And Scotty and the ghetto blaster and the skaters just kind of just passed, slowed down. Then they made a right, left, and then they were still playing, the band was still playing, and they took off and never saw them again. It was like, and I've heard many stories of what occurred after, but I guess they kept going late into the night. <laughs> oh, well, okay. <laughs> there are also a bunch of photographs from the parade uh, that were taken by Phil Krieg and George Shea and uh, some of them that came in from Michael Galbraith in our New Music America collection. They're on an iPad stand, uh, the last booth of the University of Houston booth. And Suzanne, can you tell us the, as best as you can remember, the origin story of the Fruit Mobile? Yeah, um, so I had a, a day job at that time, I was the Orange Show. My night job was I, was a, I did letterpress for public news. Um, you know, we were doing the, you know, I was involved in, in Mike, okay. So my night job was at Public News. So I would, you know, in the old days, the typesetting was done with these letters. And uh, Kevin Cunningham, who was 
involved with Jane Ludlam, who is the editor of Public News. We were standing there um, one night working, and I, I mentioned that the 19, it was 1984, that the Orange Show had been given this car by Carl Dietering, who was on our board. Um, wonderful, wonderful man. Um, and it was funny, it was a 1967 station wagon. Um, in 1984, that was, even then it was old. And we were having this gala at Marilyn's house on River Oaks Boulevard, and wouldn't it be funny, like when you went to the Museum of Fine Arts, the, the gala, they would have a car in front, and it would be some fabulous BMW or something that you could win. And at, at the Orange Show Gala, it would be a 1967 station wagon. And uh, so I was talking about that, and Kevin said, you know, um, he was in that Lawndale uh, class that Jackie and Noah and Carter and Paul and David Kidd were all in. And, and Keith, Ke uh, he said, Kevin said, well, you know, Jackie should paint that for you. And so I went and talked to Jackie, and she gave me a budget. It was $800 for the paint and the plastic and I went to Marilyn and said, what do you think? And she said, let's do it. So that was the, the fruit mobile. And it rained that night um, on River Oaks. Uh, we were under a tent. Nobody cared. Um, it was a great party because it was just like this, you know, it was almost flooding on River Oaks Boulevard. But people were having so much fun listening to Albert. It was Albert Collins. I, no, Albert King, who played that night. So anyway, it didn't get auctioned off because everybody was like, it was this long, you know, rain delayed, rain affected event. Everybody was drunk. It didn't get auctioned off. It got auctioned off a few months later and the five donors who bought it turned around and gave it back to the Orange Show. So there you go. Uh, I've, uh, I've heard from, I think it was Paul Kittleson who told me this story is, they used to all just drive around in the fruit mobile and Jackie would go anywhere and sometimes they'd pull up to a really rough looking bar and everybody else would be like, Jackie, I don't know if this is a good idea. But just the presence of the fruit mobile just made everybody love these people and buy them free drinks and all this stuff. Yeah, it's true. Thank you, Mary. We appre appreciate you. Hand for Mary Manning. <laughs> Ask an archivist. Uh, hey, Brian, uh, when did you f first start developing the Santa car? Which one? This is the Mark IV. Mark uh, one. The original. The has been on four cars since 1999. So um, Sharon and Gus Caprima gave me a, a Santa suit to uh, be Santa for some neighbors of theirs. And uh, I went to return the suit. This would have been in 92, maybe. And they said, I keep it. I went, okay. So on the way home, I stopped at a bar. And um, things went well. And uh, I realized that there's a power in the suit. So, uh, and like, I needed, a, 10 years later, I needed an idea for a car. And I, well, that makes sense, because people would start giving me Santas because I would run around in a Santa suit sometimes. So I started getting these things. And you glue something, I don't care what it is to a car, people immediately assume that you collect them. <laughs> and so they start giving them to you. It's like, no, I, I don't collect them. I, I just don't give me cloth ones. I don't want a cloth Santa. I can't glue that to a car. But yeah, so that's, <laughs> that's why I started gluing things to cars. And I, I think after 20 years, people are just starting to figure it out that I only have the one idea, and I just keep doing the same thing over and over. So <laughs> there it is. Secret's out. And sometimes you organize Santas into a reenactment of the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Yeah, every December 7th, we do a reenactment <laughs> of the bombing of Pearl Harbor, performed entirely by Santas at Market Square for about 17 years now. Why? <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. I, for a minute, I go, I, I don't know if I remember why. Uh, we used to just go crash parties and bars, and I, I was getting a little tired of that. I was wanting to inject maybe a little street theater. So I had about five ideas, and and four of them stunk really bad. We're not even going to say what they were, and but the the, the Pearl Harbor one seemed to catch on, and people go, "Let's do that again." I go, "Okay," so we did, again, and again. So. Uh, 
some of it, yeah, we had some standards on stakes. Not, not all of it. But we did crash the Benson and Elkins Christmas party at the Petroleum <laughs> Club one year. And that was just glorious, let me tell you. Um, that was good. That was good. Did they kick you out? Oh, well, I have a knack for knowing uh, when it's time to leave before security is called. <laughs> and, and that's the best. I always leave right before they call security. And so um, as, we are get, as I was getting the last sand out of the building, one of the wives was down there just chewing the security of the building out for letting us in. But they liked us when we first got there. So we started eating their food and drinking their booze. Me, no. Personally, no. Yeah, I know. I get kicked out of a St. Patrick's Day parade. Does that count? That's kind of <laughs> difficult to do. <laughs> <laughs> I follow the rules, Scotty. I follow the rules. <laughs> You're out of here, sir. <laughs> Let's talk about the wonderful world of art rules. Uh, before there was the Orange Show. Before there was the Orange Show, there was uh, pretty much a wide open town, total freedom. We had no parental supervision. We did whatever we wanted. We did some really stupid and dangerous things. Uh, we used to build cars. Uh, during the week, and on the weekend, we'd go hunt each other down and run into each other on the streets while drinking. Uh, it was a wonderful world back then. Uh, then the Orange Show came into town and sort of created a parade where we could kind of coexist and in the early days kind of help each other with our cars and, and such as that. Um, as far as being kicked out of the Orange Show, which is why I came up here, <laughs> because we had a tendency to, what was it, the, the koozie cannon, the orange cannon. The orange that, cannon, yeah. Which was actually pretty accurate, and we didn't have any accidents, but we were pelting buildings and signs from about 100 yards away with oranges. Four stories up, they were hitting windows. Yeah, it was, it was a nice little thumper. Yeah. Uh, let's see, uh, fire became... Uh, persona non grata. Uh, there was another year where there in the rules packet it said no fire, no projectiles, no something else, and then no Scott Prescott, which is one of my favorite pieces of affirmation, <laughs> I guess, that uh, um, you know, the, the, the parade has always been the most looked forward to thing in Houston for the art scene ever since its inception. And the people that suffered through all of us crazy assholes, and I say that from personal experience, uh, I, I love them for putting up with us and for trying to put everything into a conceivable package so that the general public, whoever the hell they are, could enjoy it from a safe distance. <laughs> and uh, nowadays it's uh, become something quite different and it's uh, spectacular. And uh, like I say, it's still the event in Houston as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Suzanne. Jennifer. Specifically. Jennifer McKay. Specifically. I'm yeah. going to talk to people here and see if I can't get you reinstated. <laughs> what? I'm going to get you reinstated. Uh, <laughs> no. I no. think I'll go back into obscurity <laughs> now. Uh, uh, that's a lot of stuff, guys. Okay, Mike Miano, Mike Miano part, started part the job. The it's part of the he history. made that up. He never participated. Uh, he watched us beat the living snot out of each other for the amusement of strangers. It was great fun. Um, the Ghetto Blaster kind of um, morphed into a shop I was working in. We were building all types of cars and destroying them. And, uh, you know, that one just lasted a little longer than the rest of them. Actually, Walter Hopps 
saw it at Lawndale. And in 84, um, I took it to the Museum of Contemporary Arts in LA for that show in 84, uh, Automobile and Culture. And then it went to Detroit Institute of Art uh, for a show there, where it got kicked out. <laughs> but, uh, apparently they couldn't fit it in the door. So, uh, you know, it's always had kind of a, a history like that. We used to just drop it under freeways in front of the police station. It would stay there for a couple of days. People would take photos. We'd come and tow it away, and it'd be like, old dirty underwear in the back seat. I mean, it was public art in its lowest common denominator, I would, I would suggest. And uh, the urban animals just, as far as I can tell, the first night that there were urban animals per se, we, uh, it was kind of this, this gap between disco and heavy metal. And there was a little bit of punk rock kind of popping up here and there, but there were no venues. So we were throwing parties. The Urban Animals were throwing parties. Uh, well, group of us were throwing parties. So we had it at a skate rink one night. Uh, they closed. We stole their skates. We went downtown and went street skating. And a couple of days later, we brought them back to the rink and apologized. And the guy was great. He said, look, let me get you some street skates. So street skates were just becoming popular. He started uh, bringing them into a skate shop. Everybody had them. We started running parking garages. We started doing our parties downtown. Uh, the Natives, Dr. Rocket, a lot of the punk rock bands, Teddy Boys, thank you. And uh, um, every full moon, pretty much, we had a party. <laughs> every solstice, we had a party. And the parties were huge, and we managed to break even on most of them. And uh, that was how it all got started. All the rest of it, according to these articles from all these newspapers, they made up all that shit. <laughs> None of that was in any way accurate. They all had some strange agenda that they were trying to put forth, and we just fit the bill. We were bad guys. We were good guys. I mean, depending on their angle of approach. And uh, we always found it funny, my mother especially, it was like, uh, what are you guys this week? Are you thugs? Are you artists? Are you drag queens? I go, all of that, Mom. I mean, you know, it's Houston. What's you going to do? There's nothing. We had to make up our own fun. But now there are people that help us do that and take the blame for it. Thank you very much. So. That's great. Please do visit right. Scotty's okay. station in the back. He's got some urban animals memorabilia back there. You should look through it. Which so came story directly out of a dumpster three days gone, ago. But the story oh. I wanted to tell was really prompted by what you said about that moment where the, the pamphlet or the, the application for the parade started to kind of shut it down. And so I had gotten hired, and it felt like that was part of my role, was like, I, I, think, I think we were the ones who had to say, like, sorry, no more projectiles and I remember that moment Somebody was gonna get an eye put out I well someone you know, was it was just inevitable a and and then um, no flames came with uh, Mike Scranton setting the tree on fire and so once you set the tree on fire you know the city is kind of not really interested in you Fires usually go out when I've they're set <laughs> on concrete I I agreed thought. agreed but we sort of had to rein it in and I remember that moment of having to introduce that next round and then after that there was you couldn't throw things from the parade anymore and I don't remember who instigated that but that that was one of the wonderful synergies that it felt like there was this there was this conversation that was going on between the artists and the folks who were trying to get it to the public in a particular kind of way well, what you fail to recognize is that we were all highly skilled professionals who just happened to be on acid that day. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but I also had a question for, for Brian and Suzanne, and I'm sorry to sort of do this in public, but I um, was on the brink of dropping out of Rice University, and I had a friend who knew a man who drove a car that had fruit all over it. <laughs> and I... Um, happened to be at a party at some point and met the man who drove a car that had fruit all over it and his name was Brian and he took me for a ride and a, a whole group of us and 
he talked about this mythical place called the Orange Show. And I thought, wow, I don't even know what that is. And, and since then, they've been all taking you for a ride. That's exactly right. And then, and, then, and then I think I showed up for my interview with Suzanne, and I knew nothing about the Orange Show. <laughs> all I had done was taken a ride in the, in the Fruitmobile. And, and Suzanne, you hired me, which was so special and fantastic <laughs> and amazing and wonderful. Um, but you said something earlier about going to a bar and bringing the Fruitmobile and the way that that would change. And it felt like, like the Fruitmobile did all kinds of openings. Like it, it really, if there's a history of the Art Car Parade, it, it sort of feels like we all coalesced and then the, the Fruitmobile sort of opened up this avenue to really bring it to the people. So I just thank you for that <laughs> moment. <laughs> I, I mean, I didn't know anything. I was like, Orange Show, what? The Fruit Mobile was being kept at my house for a while because I was the only one that had covered parking. Right. And, and, and I think the, the idea was it was just going to stay in the covered parking instead of me <laughs> occasionally taking it out for rides. And occasionally? Oh, <laughs> to work and stuff. But anyway, and it was, I think, when Jennifer came to work there, and that's when... Suzanne began to pick up on the thing that maybe it wasn't staying just in the covered parking. And uh, But if I had, we would have never gotten Jennifer. There you go. But I think I got in trouble for I was in trouble a lot at the Orange Show. But, uh, but yeah, it was, it was magical times. You're, you're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, maybe. There were 20 in that parade. The first one, and then when uh, in the 1988 parade there were 40, <laughs> and the next year there was 80. It was just this like, like growth. Groundswell, like yeah. it grew so fast. Yeah. Was it? Was it 40 cars or just 40 entries? Well, I don't know that. I, know I mean, that some we, of the entries yeah. were like George Shea and David Notarius. That's true. Playing a saxophone and a snare drum. Yeah, that was a long time ago, Brian, yeah. and I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I remember good bits. Yeah. Right. Hey, Cody, do you want to say anything about the project you've been involved with? Uh, Basically, uh, going through all the documentation of uh, what now uh, all, uh, 40 years uh, worth of parades, yeah. just about or all coming up on 40 years. Uh, right. What are some of the finds you've come across? Well, I, I I happen to know a lot of the things that you guys are talking about, taking up because I've had to log them every day <laughs> for like four straight months. I, I, Suzanne was fantastic at keeping the information, uh, a lot of it. So, you know, you, you were saying how in 1986, sorry, 1986 was 20, 88 was 40. I think by 1990, it was close to 250. It was fast. Yeah. It did not stop. It, it, it went so fast. Yeah. It was so, and, and with that said, so what I'm doing is I am cataloging every single entry Every single photo, every sing and the name of the artist and the, the, the photographer, if that, if that exists. All right. The director here, I need a raise. Yes. The current number, two, 250. But you know, if you think about it, you do the math, and I did it, it's around roughly unique entries, almost 10,000. Un unique entries. Um, of course, those people will have come year after year, but but you know, different different year, of course. But um, so, but there are there are years where um, there's there's complete gaps, and um, so I if if y'all have um, things, yeah, I've got it. I got from 1990. I need photos. 93. I need photos. 94. I need photos. 97. I so anyway, that, uh, I think I have all that footage. Yeah, and so uh, I, uh, I'll leave my it 20 years ago, t 15 years ago, I digitized that for the Orange Show. Good, yeah, and uh, all the footage of the parades, and 
one of the things that is the best find was a, a year when the newscasters were covering the parade, and they went from being snarky and condescending to falling in love with it. Right. By the end of the their newscast, they were just laughing and cutting up. Right. They had removed their, the stick that I guess was implanted at the network, and it was pouring down rain and nobody cared. And to me, that was the, the best part of the media uh, awareness where they finally just fell in love with the whole thing. And they quit making fun of it as being some kind of weirdo art thing. And now it was part of Houston. Yeah. Oh, and the people you got to meet, I got to meet, Rod I got to spend the day with Roger Corman. Uh, uh, you know, I don't remember if he came in for this, but uh, uh, Hunter Thompson rolled through. There were so many other people that came in as, for judges. Big Daddy Roth. Big, Big Daddy, Daddy Roth. Roth. George Clinton. Uh, but, yeah. you know, where else are you going to get a chance to interact with these people before they die? You know? <laughs> which is always the challenge as time moves on. So, yeah, I was always really thankful to these guys, even though we took the piss out of them constantly, for making those opportunities available. And sometimes unavailable. Sometimes. <laughs> um, I want to say Barbara and Mark Hinton just arrived. And really, this just is an opportunity to say, um, we were able to have the fun that we had because we had the backing and the support of a board that um, made it possible. Uh, Barbara chaired the first Art Car Ball. She, was, she has been just an uh, incredible asset to um, making it possible to do the parade year after year. And then Lynn Mathry is here and Beverly Braden. Um, Orange Show board members extraordinaire, and, and really without the support of the board, it just wouldn't happen. I think we can all cheer for that. Well, I'm sure uh, y'all have lots of questions for this panel. Am I wrong? Who's got a question? Really scream it out. God, there really wasn't one. I mean, when you think about all the things that could have happened, nothing really did. What about the archives? Can I name names? The bus. Okay. Oh, maybe that, yeah. Or the, no, the year before that, they just took a cab. Yes. They, they've been lying to all the reporters from like the Times and Post. They kept saying all these weird things, and then they just took a cab that morning. Yes. Um, yeah. But my dad's goes like, uh, can I name names? Colin Gibbons. Uh, they had an entry. Uh, they had a oh. car on top of a flatbed, something about the bliss of life with people painted in. But two cars behind them was an entry from Austin that had like a shuttle and had a 22-foot wingspan. Again, we later reduced that. We went, no, that's right. bad. So um, Colin Gibbons and them, about two blocks in the break, ran out of gas. So we'd started at the uh, Alley Theater that year. And they got two blocks down and ran out of gas. The parade stopped because the shuttle couldn't get around them. Colin Gibbons, so our mechanic shows up to give them gas, but they had took off with the keys and gas cans to the Alley Theater parking garage to siphon gas. And they and they are also as, you know, inebriated apart. So they were gone about 20 minutes before they got back. So the brakes just stopped because they ran off with the keys instead of leaving the keys in the car. I, mean, I, I, I don't know, if they were afraid somebody would steal it from the parade, which was, yeah. You know, I remember um, things that didn't happen. Uh, one year, we were going to bring the giant mousetrap from California, and it was we promoted it everywhere. The giant mouse, the life-size mousetrap is going to come. And they didn't come. And I didn't even realize it until after the parade was over with, because there was so much other stuff. Um, but the other thing I remember was getting a call. One, you know, before cell phones, the Rodney King incident happened in LA, it sparked a lot of violence. It happened that April was the time of a lot of violence with the Waco, David Koresh and Waco, it just happened that way. Um, and I got home after the Art Car Ball 
to hear this message from Marilyn, she was frantic. She's like, Suzanne, we need to cancel the ball tonight because this is happening and it's going to be violent. And, and, you know, we had just come from a ball that was wonderful. I mean, I don't think there was anything. I mean, I don't remember any catastrophes, really. Nicole Ferris did not want her to go to the parade because she, they were certain that there was going to be violence. And nothing. 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 That my that my that my fingers went numb the year that it was raining, oh, yeah. freezing cold, and whether it was April or May, I don't remember. But I mean, there, there, there were, we yeah. we put in the rules every single year, all kinds of s situations, so that we could avoid the fiascos. I mean, right? The fiasco of a person getting run over by the beads being thrown, or the trees being put on fire. I mean, we we managed to make sure there were no fiascos other than maybe some rain and someone running out of gas. Was it a mistake? Yes. Yeah. Because the artists were always one step ahead. Yes. <laughs> yes. Are you coming to say something? Awesome. Well. Hey, here we go. I have Come on. First chair of the Art Car Parade. Woohoo! When I first got involved, it was with the eye-opener committee because they were trying to do outreach to get people interested in the Orange Show. Because, you know, once people had been here, you know, what's going to make them come back? They already saw it. So we were, uh, I got hooked on the first uh, eye-opener tour, so I joined the committee. Uh, to help with this next one. And Suzanne had gotten contact from the Houston International Festival. Would you help us put a parade together? And uh, she said, with, uh, from the committee, she said, would any of you go with me to support me? And I said, sure, I'll go. And you know, not knowing what I was getting involved with. And I was working in a very boring job, oil and gas, you know, and I wanted to do something uh, more fun, and she wanted me to work on the database, and I'm like, no, I don't want to do the database, and so, uh, so that led me, and first thing we did, I went to the uh, Thanksgiving Day Parade that Foley's used to do to learn how do you put on a parade, what do you do, what do you need, you know, getting the golf carts, getting the parks department, the police, you know, uh, the Houston International Festival. We had all these different groups, you know, that uh, we had to get involved with and find out, you know, what the rules were, you know, like not throwing things out. That was a city rule at that time. And then uh, I called to start getting volunteers to help. Uh, we still have some volunteers that are still very involved that are from the very beginning. Uh, I cold called people around the United States, like the Button King, and, you know, uh, can you come to our parade? But we don't have much money. <laughs> you know, we could just give you a little s subsidence for it. And so that just led to, and we never expected it was going to last as long as it did. We were just like, okay, let's do it. You know, one year, to, uh, one time, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, just try each year and see how it goes. Never thinking that it would be lasting till now, right? <laughs> so, you know, I've been involved since before the, you know, right between 86 and 88. So then I was like, also, um, well, I need to make a car to show that anybody can make a decorated car, so I uh, and a group of, of people who had an abandoned car, we cleaned it up. It was a 1970 Buick Electra 225. We made it into the alligator car called the Bayou City Gutter Gator. And I just wanted to show, you know, that anybody can make a car. It doesn't have to be an artist, you know, and uh, just have some fun, put something together. And we just kept going. So. Uh, the car finally had to go to the junkyard. <laughs> so it's a junkyard gator now. And I think that's it. So, you know, I am involved now still with the judges committee. Uh, and I help with that every year and really enjoy that. It's, we, it's really grown into, you know, with uh, the VI pit 
everything, you know, it's just really grown into a really nice event. So not, not due to everything we did, but, you know, kind of we started it off. So that's all I had to say. <laughs> Corey, did you? Yeah. No, no the, volunteer, the volunteers were so important. Do you have any idea? Have you looked at how many volunteers over the years there have been? Oh, no, uh, I'm not calculating that, but it's a lot. It's, I mean, it's a lot. It's tremendous. Mora led this committee for how many years, Mora? Like 10? Something like that? Yeah, I mean, it, it. And then the skaters, the intersection with the urban animals and the skaters who were mobile but not in cars was such a critical component. I mean, I don't know that we could have grown crazily without that workforce. I mean, they, and, and what they brought just aesthetically, energetically was so phenomenal. I mean, it really was a, a whole kind of coming together. I would mention we're always looking for volunteers for the art car parade. So if anybody wants to get involved, come see one of us. And I don't know if we're about to wrap up, but just before um, we do, I, if anyone has any kind of documentation, art car stuff, just come, we'll hook up with me and then we'll, we'll um, figure it out. Well, we're a little bit running over, but that's okay. And some of these panelists will be back with us again at 2.30. Mark your calendars, 2.30, for the uh, Orange Show History and Conservation Panel. Uh, the parade this year, April 15th. Please come, April 14th, the Art Car Ball, right here, featuring Boyfriend and an array of other uh, entertainment. It's going to be great. Uh, it's always a good time. I really encourage you to come. Uh, yes. Sarah Gish invites anybody who was involved with the 1986 parade to come on up here. She wants to take a group picture. Capital idea. <laughs> no. All right, well, I'm going to, if you don't mind joining us, I will call on you for that. Okay. Okay. Let me finish my Giro. <laughs> I'm right over here. All right. All right. Hey, we're going to keep going, everybody. Uh, I'm going to be trying to squeeze this whole thing in within the next half hour before my dolls start their sound check at 2 or it might get a little noisy. Uh, but I want to tell you about the latest environment that we've added to our portfolio of visionary art environments here in Houston. And it's called the Hyde Park Miniature Museum. And uh, I'm really interested in this place. Look at this guy. That's D.D. Smalley. I love this guy. Uh, between 1941 and 1963, he operated a little house museum in the attic of his home at 1406 Welch Street. It's right around the corner from present day Rudd's. Rudd's was always kind of a dive bar, and D.D. Smalley lived around the corner. Uh, the house still exists. It's one of two original houses still on the block. And you can see uh, Mr. Smalley here within the Hyde Park Miniature Museum, which was a collection of uh, small little things that he found and that fascinated him in one way or another. Uh, he had a lot of things he found, arrowheads, cannonballs, uh, things that he collected. He, uh, these are, yeah, here's a cannonball right here. Uh, stamps. He had tons of stamps that he stacked. These uh, airplane, World War II bomber airplanes that he made himself. Uh, I'm going to tell you about some of this stuff, but uh, a little bit about his background. Uh, when D.D., and he's David David Smalley. He's named after both his grandfather David and his uncle David, both Davids. David, David Smalley. And uh, he uh, worked for the railroad. He was a map maker for Union Pacific. And uh, when he was still a pretty young man, he, I don't know, do you remember, uh, you guys, was it tuberculosis or something? He was in a, a body cast. Yeah. Actually, one of, I think one of the stories we think is apocryphal is that he fell out of a hayloft onto a wagon wheel right. and broke his back, which is, what a strange story that is. 
Uh, but regardless, he was in a body cast for a year, and so he whiled away his time doing things like making an elaborate little scene in a bottle. He asked for a bottle and some scraps and a knife, and he made a sculpture called My Old Kentucky Home, which was a, a little farm scene with a guy playing a banjo on a front porch with some little animals around him. He made beaded purses that they sold, and he used the money to get a headset for uh, all the other people laid up in his ward so they could all listen to the radio that he had there. And uh, he said that the radio could be your legs. He was a, a ham radio buff. Uh, and as a matter of fact, here's a picture of him before he moved to Welch Street. I think this is in his uh, workshop behind his house on Dorothy Street in the Heights. Uh, you can see some of the things that he made. Uh, on the left, you see a robot that he made. It could wiggle its ears, it could dance, uh, it could talk to kids. Uh, there's a telescope that he made. He made that telescope and he ground the lens himself. He kept a log book describing the uh, amount of clockwise and counterclockwise uh, swirls that he made to ground the lens. I mean, this guy was absolutely obsessive compulsive. You see on the right there some kind of contraption that he made that would run a certain amount of voltage through his body without causing any harm. <laughs> Uh, in this shop, he had a foot pedal so that if he had visitors, he would press on the foot pedal and it would start to make these moans from the other side of the wall, like somebody was trapped in the wall trying to get out. He was a jokester. Uh, and if you see kind of in the background, you can't really make it out, especially not with the projection we have here. Uh, but these are all cards that he collected from his uh, ham radio friends. He corresponded with people all over the country. And they did this by sending out these postcards with information about how you would find these people on the ham radio. This was the original social media, right? I mean, they were just like asking people at 4.30 in the morning, like, hey, where are you? Oh, you're in Indiana? What's the weather like there? I mean, it must have been mind-numbingly boring. <laughs> this is the house at 1406 Welch, where Dee Dee Smalley lived. And uh, his collection grew and grew, and eventually uh, it was relegated to the attic. And uh, he opened it to the public, and he gained some notoriety. Look, here's the Houston Chronicle. He's the king of hobbyists. <laughs> this guy. Uh, he learned most of what he knew, he learned from correspondence courses. He took every single correspondence course that you could take. Uh, he took a correspondence course to learn how to paint, and then he entered his first paintings in a competition downtown at the Houston Coliseum. He won first, second, and third prizes. <laughs> he had a radio show where he played the little instrument that you see over on that table. He called it the Little Joe, and uh, people would call in and try and stump him with a song that he couldn't play. Nobody could ever stump him. I mean, the Coen brothers should make a movie about this guy. It'd be amazing. He knew how to do absolutely everything. Uh, stamps. He uh, worked at the railroad. He brought home all the mail so they could steam off the stamps. And so he would have hundreds and hundreds of stamps. And he would get the neighborhood kids to stack up these stamps in like stacks, like all the green George Washington faces. And when they had 100, they would bring Mr. Smalley their stack. And he would count them out to, make, to check that their work was correct. And if it was 100, he would tie it up with a silk thread and write 100 on the back and put it in a cigar box. And there are cigar boxes and cigar boxes that are full of these stacks of stamps. I mean, what else did he do in 1945? Nothing. There was nothing to do. There was nothing to do. So you stacked stamps. Um, he collected everything. These ships you see in the picture, he made the ships. There's one ship that we have that he made that was based on a ship owned by Judge Roy Hoffheins. Dee Dee's grandson, Frank Davis, was going out with one of the judge's daughters, and she knew that Dee Dee had these ships that he built, so she brought over this damaged ship that the judge owned, and Dee Dee fixed it, and then he liked it, so he built a replica for himself. I mean, there was nothing that this guy couldn't do. Uh, he said in an interview that when you like doing something, it makes its own time. So any of us who are involved in creative pursuits, who lose track of time when we're out there doing something, Dee Dee Smalley is, he's our man. Uh, he died in 1963. The family kept the collection together. They basically just closed up the attic. Uh, you could, here's a image of a little nephew up there checking out the collection uh, in the late 1960s. 
Uh, in the early 1970s, it was opened back up to the public. In this picture, we see the grandson, Frank Davis, in the back. And that's Helen Winkler with him, his friend Helen Winkler, if you know that name. She is one of the OGs at the Manil Collection, and she also went on to start the Dia Foundation really important person in the art world. And in the 1970s, she and Frank would spend their weekends as docents at the Hyde Park Miniature Museum, ushering people through the display. So if that picture is, was taken uh, around 1973 for the Houston Chronicle, here's a picture taken by Barbara Hinton in the 1980s on an eye-opener tour. And you can see Helen Winkler and Frank Davis. They're still there sharing the beauty of the Hyde Park Miniature Museum. Uh, we got all kinds of stuff. We've got some human remains, which certainly must be repatriated. We're working on that. Um, in 1994, the family sold the house, and Orange Show volunteers helped Frank Davis pack up all this stuff into very carefully labeled boxes. Here, I'll show you. Look, that's Frank's handwriting. Every box has a number designation and a list of its contents. and. Uh, all of this stuff went into storage. It came out one time. It was shown one time since then uh, in 2002 at a place called Brazos Projects. This was Carl Killian's space next to Brazos Bookstore where he had a short-lived gallery. And this collection was reconstituted and on display for a year within a specialized structure that was made by Danny Samuels and his Rice University students. And Danny, could you tell us a little bit about what y'all did? And just, re you gotta really yell into this microphone. Okay, um, my point of tangency was very short. Helen and Carl asked, had the idea to do this, to, to do the, to restage the Hyde Park Miniature Museum in the Brazos Projects space, which was right next door to where the current Brazos bookstore is. Um, they had some photographs, they had some drawings of the attic space. My students made a design for a framework that was basically the same profile as the attic and basically replicated the shelves and display cases uh, but we only had photographs at that point. There was a, there, uh, it was a very fast project. We set it up quite quickly. Uh, and I remember when the boxes started coming in and Frank started unpacking them, every box he opened was like Christmas. <laughs> he hadn't seen it in years. And uh, he was, you know, re-astounded, re-surprised um, at each one. I remember one day coming up to uh, Brazos, and he was outside in the arcade outside the bookstore, and he had a skull in one hand, and he had a Marilyn Monroe electric toothbrush in the other hand, and he was dipping it into Varsol and cleaning out the inside of the skull. And he meticulous, meticulously cleaned out everything that was in the show. You know, at that point, I, I had known Helen for a long time. I had known Carl for a long time in other um, um, situations, but I had not known Frank at all. Everything I knew about Frank was in regard to this these few weeks, and I was amazed at the guy. I only later found out that he was best known as a musician and for inventing musical instruments, not as not as the curator of the... Hyde Park Miniature Museum. He was the, the, had a, the daddy banjo was his instrument and he played all over town and he had a motorcycle. He was an audio engineer. He recorded the 13th floor elevators. He had a goat named Mammy Goat that used to travel along with him as he went through, throughout town. Absolute fascinating person. I wish I could have known him. Absolutely fascinating guy. Um, I wish I had known more about him then. But even just that brief encounter working with him on this space was an incredible experience. I mean, I'm a collector, too, so I understood the kind of impetus to, you know, collect things and display them. And this was such a beautiful collection. 
And we are, we are very happy and lucky to have possession of it. Uh, when I started working here about two years ago, one of the first questions I asked people was, where is the Hyde Park Miniature Museum? We've got to find this. We've got to get it. And so uh, we got in touch with Laura Jo Deegan. That's her in the picture. Oh, I guess we don't have the, can you put the slide proje projection back up? OK, so there's Laura Jo. Look, she's got all of this stuff. She kept it all together. She built a shed in her backyard up in uh, uh, Sci Fair to house all this stuff. She said every time there's a hurricane, the water was up to the top step. So this stuff has been constantly in peril since it went back into storage after the 2002 display. By the way, that 2002 display, the readers of the Houston Press voted it best museum in Houston that year. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and Frank had kids stamp stacking again. <laughs> he brought that back. Uh, so, you know, uh, Laura Jo was uh, very happy to learn of our interest. If she could have put everything in my car the first day I went up to visit, she would have. It took Cody and I two trips in a U-Haul to get, get everything back here. Here's what it looked like when it, upon arrival. I mean, it is a lot of stuff. Uh, it's now all in its own dedicated room. And I want to introduce you to Jocelyn Thomas. Uh, she is a UNT yeah. student, and she's been working on this collection. Joshua, would you tell us a little bit about what you've been doing and maybe some of these objects you brought out? Sure. Um, so we're very much in the beginning stage. Wow. We're very much in the beginning stages of rescuing this collection and just assessing the condition of what we have right now. Um, I brought out a, a jar of pencil tips that <laughs> uh, he collected. This is one of two that we have. And also, uh, I found uh, this bulletin from the place he worked. He worked for Southern Pacific Railways here in Houston. And again, he's named the King of Hobbies here as well. And this also includes an image of him in his workspace. I think this is his home in the Heights and um, the robots there, the telescope is there and then all those cards from his radio broadcasts are there as well. And so it's been such a pleasure to uh, go through these boxes and see like bits and pieces of what I see in these photographs and like try to, um, I mean, it's very special to have like these things in my hand and very tangible, uh, I don't know, just pieces of this man's life. I feel like I'm getting to know him each time I go through these boxes and see like, oh wow, this must have taken ages for him to grind down the lens for this telescope or um, just like uh, the other day I found these model homes that he built and they were all um, inside of this box that was unlabeled. And unfortunately, uh, one of the models of an, an oil rig was not uh, in the best condition, but uh, the homes that he had built, which are on dis yes, they're on display at the table. So if you want to come see them, come see them. Uh, they were in really good condition. And again, like it, the level of detail is just wild because he's in each room there's furniture there's little people inside of these homes like i wish i could live inside one of the homes he created honestly <laughs> than my place. It, <laughs> but yeah it's uh, again very much at the beginning stages of this and hopefully the the long-term goal is to uh, restage the museum uh, as it existed and uh, have all these things on display for people to enjoy and admire again they're all the hundreds and hundreds of They're objects here, yes, here. Here at the Orange Show. Here. So a few years from now, we, uh, some of you know or some of you might not know, we're about to launch a capital campaign to develop this campus. Not that it isn't perfect already, but we do want to add some uh, climate uh, galleries that can be climate controlled, that can be better protected from, uh, well, you know, this place is wide open and anybody can jump over the wall. So we need to have some secure galleries around here. This is several years off. But my ambition is that we have a dedicated gallery in the new building where the Hyde Park Miniature Museum, fully restored, is permanently on display. Uh, and uh, we know how to put it back, I mean, uh, uh, in with 
its original order. We have extensive photography of its original installation, so we can find everything. They actually labeled everything in the boxes by zone, so we know how to put it back together. Uh, and I think it's just going to be such a great way for kids to learn about history. You know, like every, everybody's heard about George Washington and Sam Houston and the same old threadbare, boring stories that have been told over and over again. But if you can go walk through this museum and you can actually handle a Civil War cannonball at the end, what a great way for kids to tangibly interact with history. And by the way, I should n uh, note that um, a conservator saw a picture of me handling one of these Civil War cannonballs with an ungloved hand in a social media post and was very upset about it. But I got to tell you, we've got what, like 60 of these things? Yeah. We've got like boxes and boxes. And earlier in the day uh, that I took that picture, I had been scooping these things out of the mud uh, from Laura, Laura Joe's backyard. Uh, so I, I think we can keep one or two cannonballs that the kids can touch. Finish your thoughts. A lot of the objects are things that he, he collected, but it's important to note that there is a collection of airplanes, about 100 airplanes and trains, locomotives, that he made himself out of cardboard and wood. I mean, his basic material was spiral wound cardboard and beautiful trains. I'll be glad when you get them back up so I can get pictures of all of those. I, I don't have them, but... Um, he, carved, he carved flowers in lucite blocks. Uh, <laughs> You know, he didn't make everything, but he actually made a lot of the stuff in this collection. It's kind of incredible. I mean, he, he really could do anything. Uh, anybody have questions about the Hyde Park Miniature Museum? Larry Harris has a question. The frame, has the framework from Rice been preserved? Uh, yes and no. It's still with Laura Joe, right? But we, But it's, it's for us to go pick up. So... Yeah, it's there, it's, but it's a bit in limbo. We just got to get another U-Haul and go get it. Yep. Yeah. So she's asking about damage to Life magazine. We haven't opened those yet. We haven't opened the boxes yet. What we're doing right now is we're, we're looking at the boxes that have not, were not a part of the original or the, the Rice exhibition. Um, so that's about 40 boxes. And some of those are in, in pretty rough shape. Um, and some of those include the Life magazines. Um, I, I could tell you right now, Jocelyn's been doing the work. She's the resident archivist. But uh, in her, what do you think, percentage-wise, like um, good conditions? Probably maybe like 50-50? Unfortunately, uh, about 50-50. Um, some of these, when I'm handling them, uh, look great. And then others, as soon as I touch them, maybe like the cover will fall off. And immediately I'm like, OK, let's put this one back. Um, but I think. A uh, one of the ambitions for this restaging of it is to actually uh, have a lot of these books and magazines uh, organized in a library for, for reference, and um, hopefully enough of them are in good enough condition to do that. <laughs> and one big step, one, one big thing that we're working on uh, back in the, the archive or while processing this is marrying his handmade, and I made printouts for y'all, so there's a stack here, um, but it looks like this. It, it, he, he made a, uh, an itemized catalog of uh, 1,600 objects, each one handwritten, where it was from, and any information he may have had if it was donated to him by a neighbor or something. Um, and what we're trying to do is First, digitize this, put it in a spreadsheet, which is mind-numbing. And then two, start to marry those with the objects themselves. Oftentimes, they'll have the, the tags attached with the numbers still attached. And the Rice students were super fastidious in kind of keeping the, the um, 
or at least the packing of, of it was really was great because you. I think Frank packed. It. Oh, Frank packed. Okay, well, he was really good on on keep. But then the the ones that we're dealing with right now, a little less uh, attention to detail. So there's going to be some wiggle room. We have plenty of photos, but we want to attribute certain things specifically to their to their uh, catalog number. I, I wanted to mention, uh, Melissa just mentioned the presence of these wax cylinders in this collection. There's a lot of obsolete technology. Uh, we recently had this artist, Maria Chavez, with us. She's created this whole uh, sculptural installation that surrounds us. She's a conceptual sound artist. And the main part of her practice is uh, she's a turntablist who piles up broken shards of records on the turntable. It creates her own samples. It's really avant-garde and amazing. And she did these couple of workshops with kids and adults here during her residency, and she walked them through the whole history of sound recording and sound technology, and she's telling these kids, like, okay, well, you know, uh, they started off with these things called wax cylinders. They were kind of like this. She's describing them verbally, and then they moved to these shellac records. I don't have any of these with me because they're so rare and hard to find these days. And I'm like, I'll be right back. And I, I went in the building, and I came back with a wax cylinder and a shellac record out of the Hyde Park Miniature Museum collection. And so she was actually able to show these kids, like, this is the evolution of te technology, and here's how we've wound up where we are today. So again, like, this is why I think it's going to be like a really important teaching collection for us. One, one more question. We have time. Five, yeah. five minutes. Yeah. Barbara, yes. Yeah, wait, sorry, say it again. One more time. Oh, yeah, oh, right, that's a good point. So I aren't, isn't there a scheduled tour of the, okay, I'll do it. Yeah. If, if after this, if any of y'all wanna come back and have a look at what we're up to, and Jocelyn can, have a, can talk about her process a little bit, y'all come, we can, we, can, we can do that just directly after this. Yeah, let's, let's go look. It's and gonna be in the back, yeah, the back back. Anything else you guys wanna say? Um, go Strohs, I don't know. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, thanks for your attention, everybody. Don't forget, 2.30, Orange Show History Panel, My Dolls at 4. Visit the Orange Show, but don't go in the back. Go around the side gate. That's all. Thank yeah, you. Yeah.